Ladies and boys and girls, we're back for session two for the 2021 HSSRA training sessions, winter training sessions. Again, I want to thank Randy Gardner and CBC for helping us do this and make this possible for you. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, some different topics tonight as we did from the last time. Sorry it took so long, but we have a scheduling to, to deal with. Remember that uh, these sessions are, are being done for your advantage, so I'm hoping that everybody's paying close attention. There'll be some other things that we'll discuss later on as the, as the night goes on, but I look forward to any feedback with regard to this, and it's going to be on the officialsmind.com website, which is Karen Swanner's and the HSSRA website. And now I'll turn it over to Tim Lammering. Good evening, members. My name is uh, Tim Lammering. I'm one of your board members for the High School Soccer Referee Association, and I'm a current member for the last 13 years. What I'd like to do is uh, take about 20 minutes of your time tonight and go over the dual system, two-man referee system that we're currently using freshman, JV, and some varsity with the uh, non-conference games. Uh, since this is not a live audience tonight, if you have any questions, concerns, or suggestions, uh, feel free to give me a call, send me a text or an email, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. So with that being said, what we like to do is the objectives of the two-man system is you want to re identify responsibilities of the dual system officials perform basic mechanics in and presenting, presenting in a manner, describe general patterns of movement, describe major set positions, use identifying responsibilities of lead and trail officials. This, the lead and trail official, this is what's critical in this presentation tonight, and you'll see those throughout the slides. Head referee, we should all know by now when you go into Arbiter who the head referee is. Usually it's in a bold print. That's your head referee. This is the referee that's going to, if in a dual system, there is two calls, simultaneous calls, or an interpretation of the rule needs to be made. It's the head referee's position and responsibility to, to take that part. Um, you're going to conduct a pregame conference. Very important, very, very important in a two-man that you have this pregame conference because you need to know where everybody's going to be between you two, who is, where you're going to be at all, in all situations. And if there is a simultaneous whistle between you two, you guys need to talk about who's going to take the lead on it. Uh, if you have comm systems, it's great to use in a two-man system, uh, but without the comms, you still need to make eye contact throughout the game and you'll probably have to use a lot of your uh, body, body language with your file recognitions and your file displayed so everybody knows what's going on. Uh, match authority on rules, interpretation, equipment. Who's the head referee? Again, it's, you guys should know that going in already, who the head referee is going to be. Um, and that's something that you need to know before you get to the field and once you're on the field as well. Planned duel will be designated unplanned dual higher ranking. So if it's not in bold, which it usually is an arbiter, it's the most senior referee that's going to be on site. Referee team pregame. Inspect the field and players together. So you're going to go out on the field and you're going to do your thing by inspecting the field, the netting, the flags, uh, your markings on the field, and you're going to identify the players with their jerseys, their numbers, making sure everything is according to high school regulations. Um, when you're doing a two-man, you're going to determine the lead and trail at all times. Usually um, at the coin toss, the winning team that wins the, uh, the kick to start off, it's the trail that is always given the whistle first. So you're going to make sure that you guys are both aware of that as well. Deciding the touchline goal line responsibilities, which in all these graphics you'll see that, and we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, establish that throughout. Review proper mechanics, techniques. Again, this is your, your signs that you're going to give that you're going to display not only for your partner but for the players as well. Emphasize eye contact and consult if needed. Eye contact is huge in a two-man uh, system, very important in a two-man system that you guys are always looking at each other and getting, getting the signs that you're putting out on the files out there so everybody can see them. 
simultaneous whistles, defer to the head referee as I spoke just, just moments ago. If you have two whistles at the same time, you guys need to come together. If you have comms, you need to communicate that, and it's up to the head referee which, which way you guys are gonna go with that call. And then coordinate issues, substitutions, and injuries. Also on your restarts, it's gonna be very important that during this two-man system on the restarts that you guys are in the proper position for a trail and lead, who has the whistle, and where you guys should be at all times on these restarts. And again, we'll have uh, some slides in here to show you exactly what I'm talking about. All right, making a call, responsibilities for restart whistle. Trail whistle, you're always gonna start, that's the kickoff. The trail referee is always gonna give out that whistle first. Drop all, that's, that's a question mark. It depends on where you're at with the drop ball. It could be the lead, it could be the trail, and whatever best fits that situation where the ball is gonna be dropped at. Goal kicks and throw-ins. Remember on the drop ball again this year, it's not contested. It's always one player now for injuries, for stoppage of times. It's not gonna be contested. So it's gonna be a little bit easier on that referee that has that drop ball situation that you're not gonna have to worry about two man battling for the ball now. On your lead whistle start, corner kicks, penalty kicks, free kicks, and throw-ins on the lead side. Subs, officials responsible for restart whistles. Again, that's gonna be a communication not only with your eye contact, but possibly, and it should be, on your body language too. Usually on a two-man system, if benches are on both sides, but the sub is all the way across the field, you want your official to give you a thumbs up or let you know a play's ready to go uh, so you guys can go at it and, and start with that whistle. All right, making a call, eye contact essential. In this diagram here, you'll see that the play is right in front of this referee. It could be the trail referee, it could be the lead referee. And he blows the whistle and he makes the call. But we all know it's all about angles. So what happens if the lead referee in this scenario here doesn't see a foul that's happening in front of him, but behind him there's a shirt pull or a, a kick in the back of the leg or something that the trail referee sees? Again, pregame and how you guys talk about that in your pregame is essential. What I usually tell the guys in a two-man is give me a second to see if I'm going to play the advantage or if the whistle's coming up to my mouth. If, I, if, if you see that, let me have it. If you don't see it, feel free to give me the call but then we need to communicate with what we did in this two-man system. If you have comms, you can give it to them right away. If not, you want to display what you have, and we'll go from there. But it's essential that eye contact on everything that you have in the two-man is spot on. On this slide, you'll see the dual system of control. Can you go up just a little bit more, Karen? Thank you. <clears throat> Here, the lead referee, look at, look at your boundary lines. Look at how far you have to travel in a two-man system. This is all yours. You may not have to run to this physical point up here, but the lead referee is going to be responsible for everything on the goal line and everything on the touch line that's behind them. And the trail referee, the same way. He's got the same responsibility and the same distance. Don't get caught up that if you're the lead referee and play is down here, this is perfect positioning here for anything that's in your area. And you can see how the trail is all the way in on this side of the 50 and pinching in. The days I personally feel are over for a trail referee to be sitting on the touch line at the 50. Those days are over. You need to, you need to squeeze in as much as you can and support your lead referee. In these situations, your head is always on a swivel. You're always looking around to see where you need to be and start anticipating play way before it happens. Here's another great example of what I was just talking about. The trail referee, these are, these, these, this, this scenario here could have been years ago where he would stop at the 50 and then he's done. Everything else was the lead referee. That's not true anymore. You need to get in and there's several times where you need to put, pinch into this corner down here, let your lead referee have any possible offsides in, in here with the second to the last defender, but you need to pinch in over here and help that situation out as well. Um, it takes a lot of physical endurance, anticipation, and you're, like I said, your head is always on a swivel. You're always looking around. But this is what you have to go through when you're doing a two-man system. Keep playing between you on the 30 and 40-yard rope. What, they, what, what we're trying to explain to you here is that you want to stay within 30 or 40 yards of the play, no more. Um, 
I, I personally feel you can probably get a little closer than that. You should know within the first five, seven minutes of the game of your striker up front, how, how fast is he? Are, are they servicing the ball a lot to him? And your second to the last defender on your, or your defense, are they pinching in a lot? Uh, you need to make, start analyzing those situations so you can figure out how far you can go and how fast you have to get there. Again, on here, the lead referee is all the way coming back to the attacker and he becomes the trail where the trail referee is all the way down in the box with the second to the last defender. Again, you can see the amount of distance that you have to cover at the drop of a hat, but that is something that you guys need to do and we ought to be doing that by now in these two-man systems. Here's a great illustration of the no touch line hugging. If you look at this graph here, you have to be flexible in your pattern on your run. This is all the area that you should be covering throughout the game. You shouldn't, again, stop here at the 50 or have your partner have to take more of the field because you're not getting down deep enough or not getting back fast enough. Uh, it requires a high work rate and to have to stay close enough in order to not, not really sell the call but be there to make the call. Uh, a lot of times in a two-man system, if you're too far back, and you make that call, you're going to not only hear an earful from the players, but the coaches as well. So the closer you are to that play, the better you have the opportunity to make the correct call, and you keep the players and the coaching staff uh, more confident in your ability to control the game because you're right there where you need to be. So this is a great example of how much area and how much running you should be taking during the game. Here, again, this is a no touch line hugging. On this, you can, you can see that if you had a corner kick or a play up here that results either in a goal kick or possibly the keeper comes up with it, and now you have a quick transition all the way out with either a punt, a goal kick, or a service down the middle, and you gotta really get on your horse and head downfield. You don't wanna be caught up here when the ball's already at the 50 and you're still running to get down there because now your trail referee, who's going to become your lead referee, has to possibly pinch in and lose his side of the second to the last defender. So it's really imperative that you anticipate the play and you're watching and you're trying to manage the game earlier on with how fast their breakouts are, how, how deep the keeper will be punting the ball if he can or cannot punt the ball that well, and same thing with your goal kicks. So again, you got to get down here and be in the right position at the right time to make those calls. That's okay. Covering the coffin, covering the coffin corner, I should say. Again, this is similar to the last graph we just saw, how the trail referee is all the way up around his, maybe his 10 or his six, and he's following the attacker all the way down into that corner, that, that's the coffin corner. Uh, it's a terrible position to be, especially when you're in a two-man but it needs to be done. You need to get down there to make any type of call that is going to be made down there. It's not to say that your lead referee cannot make that call for you, but again, it's better for you to make that call when, if you're going to need to sell that call or to, to control the game, keep control of the game. Uh, the trail must press down with play. Lead is usually screened and must split his focus to determine the offsides. Running off the field may be required, especially on your touch lines. It's just like a diagonal system. The lead referee should be closer to the goal than the thrower in order to cover goals scored as well as offsides. In one of these slides, you're also going to see, and, we, and we've, we've seen it personally, and we might have been part of it in the past, but on these throw-ins, if you want to be on the field, that's perfect, but you shouldn't I, I don't think you should be over here like in the place of a corner kick because now you're losing your focus for the, the second to the last defender with an offsides. You need to be in the correct position. So in this graph showing the lead ahead of the, the throw in is a perfect situation. And then the trail as well. See how far in this trail is getting to cover anything that's at the top of the box and any play that may be serviced over into that area. Okay, play near the goal. Again, on, on this slide, this is the point that I was just trying to make. This lead here is off the field, kind of like taking a position where you would a corner kick, which I think is not a good position for him because now he's losing focus on the second to the last defender. 
if he came over here where the corner flag is, and he's even with the second to the last defender, he can get everything that's in front of him and everything that's inside the box as well as where he loses his focus on the second to the last defender in that position. Again, the trail is not up here at the 50. He's not hanging down there waiting for the ball to come to him. He's pressuring himself to get in there to support that lead and to take anything that's out in that area. And it's, it, it can be a, a transition, as, as you can see in this graph here. Again, I wouldn't be in this position here. I would stay over on this flag side. And, and, and if I had to come into the field and approach into the goal, goal area, I could do that from on, on the field, not off. Play near the goal here. They got, them, they got them positioned off here for the attacker with the balls here. I don't think this is a good position for anybody to be in unless it's a corner kick for yourself or if it's a penalty kick that you're, you're taking as a lead. I think you need to be out here on this corner flag where you can get the second to the last defender with your offsides and keep a visual on that as all, at all times. All right, these last few uh, graphs that we're going to see is going to set the positions for the start of play, during play, free kicks, corner kicks, goalkeeper clearance, goal kicks, penalty kicks, throw-ins, and a drop ball. So again, on your start of play, the trail referee is the one that always has a whistle. That should be established right before the game starts. Uh, you need to make sure that you guys are both on cue for who has that whistle to start the game, but it's always the trail referee that has that. During play, <clears throat> again, here on this graph here, the trail referee is following his attacker in on this side of the field with the lead setting up in his quarter that he can keep an eye on second to the last defender and any type of offsides. And the same thing with the lead here. The lead's down in his corner, but as we can see here, the trail is sucking in towards the middle to support any ball that is being played over in that area or any foul that may arise out of that with the lead referee, even with the second to the last defender. On your free kicks in the, in the attacking half, the trail referee moves even with the balls. He's gonna cover placement, encroachment, and delay. So here we have a free kick, a direct kick, this referee, the trail referee, is going to sit there. If he has a drop ball, he's going to make that drop ball there. If it's a, he's going to be able to watch for any type of encroachment on the ball. And he's also going to have the restart when the, if it's a, a ceremonial restart, which, in, which ensures that the lead is going to be in the position over in this corner here. The lead referee, go ahead and he moves ahead for play or goal coverage and eye contact or repeat direct free kick or indirect free kick signal to show readiness. On corner kicks and goalkeeper clearance, again, on corner kicks, great positioning by the lead and perfect positioning by the trail. You gotta get in there around the 18 on those and the same thing with the you know, goalkeeper clearance. Trail referee is coming up outside the box, even with the second to the last defender and the lead is all the way back. These are just some more graphs on the goal kick. Uh, perfect positioning on here. But on a two-man, on the penalty kick, uh, this is something that we should be talking at our pregame with as well. We need to let know the trail and lead on a penalty kick. Here, the lead's going to have a huge responsibility with our new rules this year, with the goalkeeper having to be at least one foot on the line at all times. So that's going to be his responsibility right there. As a trail referee, you're going to have two responsibilities. You're going to have a responsibility of the attacker, make sure that he does not stop at all during his encroachment onto the ball, and you're going to look for encroachment on this. So you really need to get in there, but that's something you both basically need to cover in your pregame prior to the game and any type of kick. Throw-ins. It's pretty uh, typical on this throw-in. The trail referee can be off the field or right on the, on the touch line there with a visual downfield and he's, and he's watching for any foul throw in or anything with the attacking team. Lead is even with the second to the last defender in his area. On this one, I, I, I say on this graph, they, they went ahead and they put the lead on the field in front of the play. I disagree with that. I say the lead should come off the field 
and be even with the second to the last defender as opposed to on. When you put yourself in that position, they could play you as a wall or, or a decoy, and you don't want to be in that position. So I would say remove yourself from the field, line yourself up with the second to the last defender, and be able to get anything in this area that may arise. Again, drop ball, I mentioned earlier, with the new rule, it's, it's, it's non-contested now. You won't have a, a drop ball with two players involved at the same time, which makes it easier for the two-man advantage here. Uh, on the trail, the trail referee, if it's your drop ball, you don't have whistle, right? You're gonna let your lead have the whistle because you're gonna be sitting there with a the ball in one hand. You don't wanna go ahead and put the ball and the whistle up at the same time. Uh, lead official anticipates play. Direction of play could change quickly. Again, you need to start looking at all times what's gonna be coming up. Anticipate play, and officials need to be ready to adjust quickly. Set positions, uh, start of play, during play, free kick, corner kick, goalkeeper clearance, goal kick, penalty kick, and throw-ins. Uh, that's everything that we just discussed on these last few slides. Is that it? I think that's it. So, I know this was very fast and we went through it pretty good, but these graphs really show and display what we need to do. Um, again, you're gonna find yourself in these freshman JV and some of your varsity in a two man, uh, but what, what we have to do is we need to start thinking ahead of time, before the game, during the game, and halftime. You need to get on your horse, you need to get your communication with your partner down, and great eye contact throughout the whole game is beneficial not only to you, but the players as well. If you have any questions, concerns, or suggestions, feel free to reach out to me, either a phone, uh, text, or an email, and you can find me in your Arbiter page. Thank you. Good evening, members. This is Dennis Helker. I'm a former uh, board member and an officer of the association, and I'm a longtime member of 35 to 40 years. I'm here tonight to give you some information to help you guide through how to become a better referee. It all starts with making it your way and personalizing the game to your style, your personality, and the, the risk that you want to run and how you want to deal with players effectively. The first thing is originally the, there was no referee. The players needed somebody to arbitrate their disputes. So eventually they asked somebody to do it. They did them on the stands and then they eventually ended up going onto the field itself. You are the servant of the game. The game is for the players and the fans. Your major responsibility to this beautiful game is, number one, safety of the players, two, equitable. You have to be fair with everybody, and then for the enjoyment of the players and fans. You need to personalize it with your path. It starts with the knowledge and applications of laws, rules, and traditions. There's 11 major or direct free kicks, and there's seven types of misconduct or behaviors. A foul is defined by its physical, its physical contact, it's on the field of play, the ball's in play, and it's against the opponent. There's 11 of them. Simple thing is the sum of one, two, three, four. Plus there's a new one that came in recently, that's one to grow on so it makes 11. There's seven misconducts, seven cautions or yellow cards, seven red cards or ejections, disqualifications, whatever you wanna call it. Okay, then the important thing is there's eight starts and restarts. One's on the touchline, two's on the goal, five's on the field. The requirements for the ball to be in play. When the ball is out of play, it either has crossed over the boundary lines completely or the referee stops the match with a whistle. Offsides is fairly easy. There's only two times in the game. Dynamic play or all free kicks. That offside is applicable. For scoring, you can score directly on all of the starts or restarts with that go by that start that are by the foot, except for by definition the indirect free kick. 
drop ball is in effect a direct indirect free kick and the throw in is by the hand so that's not applicable. The 11 major are direct free kicks, the DFKs. The components for that, it must be against an opponent. Usually it's physical contact with the exception of the handball. It must occur on the field of play and all the balls in play. If it's, okay, again, there's 11. One with the mouth is spitting. Spitting is always misconduct and a red card. There's two illegal challenges or charges or challenges. Three with the hands, I'm sorry, three with the feet, four with the hands. Plus obstruction if there's physical contact initiated by the defender. If it's, if you have a stoppage and it's a foul, if it's not one of the directs, it must be indirect by nature. There's over 30, over 30 something indirect reasons for an indirect free kick. Two, carelessness by a player is a foul. If it, it can be clean, et cetera, et cetera, if the referee's opinion it's a careless act, it's a foul, even though they got the ball cleanly. Knowing and visualizing these 11 sets your criteria, gives you consistency for your foul recognition, and gives you the confidence needed when they become highly controversial incidents. Your mis all your misconducts or behaviors must be synchronized with the 11, appropriately with the 11 direct free kicks. Choose, set and choose your bedmark, benchmarks for the misconduct. Visualize them. How long does it take for the hold? How much physical force do you have? Et cetera, et cetera. Next. These red cards are easy. There's two red cards for violence. Serious foul play and violent conduct are the two. Spitting at a person is always a send off. It may be a foul if it involves, if it involves the definitions of, of, the, of the fouls. There's two reds for dog sows, and your criteria there is the Ds. Distance from goal, direction headed towards the goal, and how many defenders. And the, and the other one of the five is the second caution. The more difficult ones is foul, abusive, offensive, and insulting language. The key here is, is it public? Who hears it? How loud is it? Is it made personal? That is usually by voice inflection or physical space. And then finally, is it provocative? Is it directed, is it directed and is it statements provocative to it? This includes actions, gestures, including taunting. Endangering opponent's safety is a red card. Doesn't make any difference. Doesn't make any difference if it's a foul or not foul. Next. Yellow cards, cautions. There's two yellows, one for entering or leaving the field of permission, a field of play without the official's permission. Two. Persistent infringements. That could either be a team tactic or a series of fouls within a short period of time or, or a bunch of fouls over a period of time. Failure to respect the required distance, delaying the restart of play. The more difficult ones is dissent because you have so many options dealing with language, dealing with emotional responses. Is it reactionary? Are it summonous, is it reactionary or is it deliberate because they're attempting to show you're up or undermining your authority? Or is it a lack of your confidence and self esteem that you're not sure of your standards? You're not sure what went on and you feel like it's a challenge to you and you have to do it. Okay? Unsporting behavior and contact. Can't get into that because there's so many of them but includes hard play, 
inappropriate language, and a bunch of others. Recklessness, if a player's reckless on their challenges or any of the other fouls, then it has to be a yellow card or caution offense. Okay? <clears throat> Matching the player's skill level with, with your official's fouls and misconduct, recognition and selection. It's key, and this comes in to play in your game management as Karen uh, alluded to in the last session. <clears throat> Matching these various, has many factors and various factors. The key here is communication. Communication, this has three parts to it. The nonverbal, body language, your voice, and your words. It's what they see that's the most important. They read your body language. They don't hear your words, and the inflection of your words is more important than the words themselves. And when you speak, the more you talk, the more trouble you can get into. Keep it short and sweet and to the point. There are many factors in these, in match, in these various levels. Many factors, it's a matrix, depending upon the skill levels, players, field conditions, age. The players determine the type of game they want to play. You adapt and are flexible as responses to their play within the scope of the laws of the game. You have need to work on de-escalation skills, have knowledge of the starts and restarts and their standards of ball and play, which is the ball and play has to be a certain spot, players must be a distance, the ball must be kicked and moved, the, state, the ball must be stationary, and most importantly, it must have the official's permission, vertly or covertly, with whistles. And how to use these knowledge of starts and restarts in your game management in specific places for a desired result. Your, 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 your style and the amount, you, it'll be your style and the amount of risk taking you want between the balance between game flow and game control. Part of this mix is when you walk away or, ver or ignore people versus when to pick your opportunities to set what you need to set for purpose. There's actions, decisions every 30 seconds. So pick what you want to be effectively to deal with it. Ignoring is an extremely powerful tune, to, <clears throat> tune because you do not give or acknowledge the person. So they don't have any power. If you get a, resp if you, if you get a feedback in response, you've acknowledged that person. Okay? Reading body language and then select what kind of response you want to that particular body language with your own. Discussions with players. There's private ones, and you don't need to speak. You just need to go out of your way after you've seen something committed by a player and walk by them, and everybody knows you've sent a message. You have public statements. It's marking the sands. If you see something that you don't like and you see it occurring, and you don't want that to occur anymore, just yell out. Stop the holding. Let everybody know. Okay? That's, that's an area that you don't like. If you got pushing from behind on, uh, on stuff, on where players trying to mark up and control the ball, and you got pushing and it's getting to the level you think you need to deal with, just tell them. Keep it there. Okay, and then you have uh, your use of how to, how to manipulate or tactically use time, your whistle and voice inflections, nonverbal hand signals, and body language to communicate. You don't, 
just somebody says something, a quick look, you sent a message. You got, they got your attention. And by altering your body language to either a relaxed position or one that looks like you're more stern and serious uh, with a rigid stance, or a quick gesture, body language. Uh, your discussion at misconduct. Normally want to isolate that individual to send a message. You isolate them, and your body language not only tells him something, but tells all the other players and fans and coaches what, how you feel about the situation. <clears throat> then the understanding of the big gray area. That's where it's trifling and doubtful, or nothing because of the uh, skill levels, or you may be seeing where the players want to, how the players want to play before making critical decisions, as long as it's within your, your uh, authority and within the boundaries of the laws of the game. <clears throat> that involves risk taking. Expanding your options. First difference between the first call, your foul selection on the first call and your foul recognition. For those who are in the advanced phases, then the risk taking occurs there. Post-match post feedback from your partners. Seek it. Find specific incidents in your games and ask for feedback from your ARs, or if you're the AR from the referee, why did they call it that way? Or what other options do they have? <clears throat> Players have expectations from the officials. C, safety, equality, and enjoyment. Your work rate, how close we do to play, good angles with effective communication, including the whistles and signals, both the formal signals and informal signals, including your hand signals. Your calls and no calls, and your consistency standards based upon their skill levels. You bring justice to the game. If you don't bring justice, the players will. Mastering the arts and science of officiating. It's knowledge, training, experience, and feedback. It requires your desire, knowledge, application through various phases of development for with both negative and experimental results for your growth. The most important part is your nonverbal body language and your communication skills. Everybody sees you, very few hear you. Here's your phases, starting intermediate, advanced, and professional. Passage through them requires the, that phase or understanding before the next higher level plus, plus normally science uh, soccer background, either as a player or as a coach. It takes a official as long as a player to develop your skills. <clears throat> this process takes your time, knowledge, experience, determination, failures, instant law recall, devotion, effective communications, and help from others with feedback and setting your own unique and personal style of game management as you progress. The spirit of game allows you to bend but not break the laws. Officials are always right when it comes to their decisions based on opinion, and many times even correct. There's a difference between being right and being correct. Good evening. I'm your election committee member here, and what we're gonna be doing here possibly in April is vote on new president, treasurer, and board members. We got the incumbent Tom Smith for two-year term as president. And then for treasurer, we have a two-year term with Dan Imick and two contenders, Don Hubert and Dennis Helker. Board members is a three-year term. The incumbent is Pam Bowman, and the other is Bob Wallace, the incumbent, and Kevin McGinnis is one of the ones for this. And I am also in charge of the Tom Smith Jr. Memorial Golf Tournament in July 31st at the Incline Golf Course in Forsell, Missouri. This is July 31st. 
I will be sending out the attachments of the flyers on the front and the back for registration for those that are interested. This is for a good cause for the backstoppers and Special Olympics. And I hope everyone is willing to come out on this festivities, which everything that you will be paying for on your player fees will cover your dinner, your lunch, the golf cart, and the course. So other than that, be expecting the email with all this information and the attachments. And I do thank you and have a nice evening. Okay, Jet ladies and bo uh, boys and girls, we're back again. And in case, in case you came in late, my name is Tom Smith, and I am the current president of uh, HSSRA. And uh, the way it's looking, I may be doing it again. Anyway, one thing I want to talk to you about, and uh, Misha has sent this out. It's a flyer of the rule modifications for this year based on our pandemic scenario. Make sure you read it. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, pay close attention to what I'm telling you here. Do not, officials, do not make yourself responsible for monitoring activities on the sidelines such as social distancing, hand washing, symptoms of illness, or other such issues. The coaching staff and the school personnel and administrators responsible for that. Your job is strictly one dimension. You got a game, you got 22 players on the field, deal with them. Do not, do not make yourself the uniform police, the social distancing police, just do your job. Please, enjoy the game, let the kids enjoy the game, and let the rest of the world take care of the, the tragedies that they think that's going on. There's uniform changes. Read the legal uniforms that you're gonna to have to know about with regard to the changes. The long sleeves are permissible, long pants are permissible, undergarments, obviously the same color. Uh, don't, don't, get, don't get into the uniform police thing. As long as the kids, they're distinguishing colors, try to live with it, please. We'll get through this in spite of ourselves. Uh, with regard to officials, it's up to you whether you wear a mask or not. If the players want to wear them, that's fine. Coverings, that's fine. Whistles you use, electronic, not electronic. I don't recommend electronic, but that's your call. Gloves are permissible. Obviously, there's some folks that uh, have a thing about touching each other. Well, we're not going to deal with that, so just do the game. Please, keep it simple. Pat's not here tonight for the legal issues, but he wanted me to bring that to your attention. He's going to bring it back to your attention in the next session. Do not get involved other than what's going on on the field. Please, please, please. Uh, our elections, probably in April, the way it's looking, we're not going to be able to get a building for March that's centrally located to make everybody happy so they can show up. Uh, we will not, at this stage, we're not going to have an email vote. We're not going to have a mail-in vote. It's going to have to be an in-person vote. And we just have to get a facility to bring people together for that one, one particular event. And if Randy and uh, CBC are, are uh, open and willing, we'll probably have one more session. Hopefully by August, we will, everything will be clear enough where we can have our standard Uber day. If there's any questions or confusion, please call, email, I'll answer. Well, to most of you anyway, uh, but I will answer. Uh, I'll, whether one way or the other, in communication, uh, verbal or in written, I will answer. But make sure you read the booklet on the rule modifications for soccer. It was sent out by Misha the other day Please, please read it. Know what's in there so you're not, you don't find yourself in a verbal confrontation with coaches and players over something that you probably shouldn't be involved in anyway. I don't see any, any reason for us to stay any later tonight. I'm glad you could all make it. And we're going to run this one more time. 
The Chaminade training is in July. Doug, has, uh, George has sent that out already. Prepare yourself. The season starts March 24th, 20th, the week of the 20th, somewhere in that ballpark. Um, let's get ready to go. Get your business done. Get your equipment ready to go. Uh, work with the assigner as much as you can. And one last thing, make sure that your fees are structured properly for your doubleheader games. There are still some schools out there that are trying to get you to paint the uh, entire house when they only hired you to paint the room. So just make sure that your fees are right. Questions, confusion. Check with the assigner first. If you run into that dead end, give me a call. I'll get in an argument with him. But don't you do it. Let's keep it as simple as we can. Remember, any confusion, call any of us, the presenters tonight, email them, text them, ask them if you got a question about what they talked about. Likewise for me, and we'll get you the answers one way or the other. Thank you and have a good evening.